Hello and welcome. Uh, we were discussing uh, different applications of lasers. So, uh, today we will be talking about uh, applications of lasers in uh, medical science and related areas. So, lasers can have uh, you know different types of applications in the you know medical uh, field. So, uh, it can have application in dentistry, uh, cardiovascular medicine, dermatology related to skin, uh, gastroenterology which uh, deals with uh, you know uh, treatment or diagnosis in the gastrointestinal tract, uh, gynecology, uh, neurosurgery, ophthalmology and uh, otolaryngology and many other things. It may not be possible for us to you know go through all the different areas in medical science where laser can be uh, application uh, ap applied, uh, but some of them we will definitely look at. So, we will start with the cardiovascular diseases. Uh, so, in cardiovascular diseases uh, lasers are mainly used for uh, laser angioplasty, laser thrombolysis, photochemotherapy laser treatment of uh, erythmias uh, and uh, transmyocardial revascularization. The thermal interaction, photoablation and photochemical interactions are uh, three different uh, modes of uh, the laser treatment used in this particular uh, segment. So, for example, uh, the laser angioplasty uses thermal effects. So, uh, uh, on your screen you can see that uh, the image is given uh, for a uh, you know uh, part of artery where you send in your laser through uh, fiber optic cable and uh, in the affected region where so it is written you know given by this uh, yellow color. So, in this region you have kind of blockage in the uh, you know artery and this laser uh, you know is um, sent by fi uh, fiber optic cable. So, uh, a focused laser beam is uh, you know uh, used to remove those blockages that is created in the artery in case of uh, angioplasty. So, normally angioplasty is done using uh, something called balloon surgery where you uh, send uh, one small device with which has like a propeller kind of features. So, it goes and open you know uh, inside the uh, artery and then it starts uh, you know moving and that uh, you know takes out those you know blockages and those uh, you know debris are actually uh, uh, comes into the blood. So, uh, Using laser, you you can uh, you know do it in a much better way compared to this balloon surgery because here you just you know uh, completely you know destroy that uh, you know uh, region which is creating this blockage within the artery. Uh, another uh, very obvious application of laser is the uh, you know removal of uh, dental enamel. So in uh, many cases we have uh, you know uh, cavities formed in the uh, you know teeth. So, uh, there are affected areas in, in particular you know teeth, uh, one can use a laser beam to uh, totally remove that uh, you know infected region uh, and uh, this is uh, you know not only done to remove the dental element enamel. Uh, but also dentine or it is also used in case of you know bone or cementum. And this technique is much superior than the conventional technique where uh, you use a drilling machine uh, and uh, you know you clean your teeth or say some affected region of bones. Uh, here it you know use of uh, laser is 
you know much less painful in many cases is almost painless compared to the conventional method. And uh, the commonly used uh, laser for this purpose is a carbon dioxide laser, uh, which essentially it ablates uh, some region of that uh, teeth, uh, wherever it is required or you know it can uh, vaporize that one also. Uh, so, you can remove a very thin layer of that uh, you know uh, portion or you know plaque on the in the teeth or bone or even in the soft tissues. Okay. So, uh, this is also uh, much better than you know, conventional you know surgeries where you uh, go through really painful uh, you know uh, uh, methods of uh, removing the affected parts of teeth, skin, bone, etc. Uh, so, uh, in terms of you know like in the case of dermatology, the uh, most common imperfections of the skin such as you know uh, pigmented lesions. Uh, so, like you know you have you know many cases on the skin there are like you know either white or you know dark spots appear. So, also you know uh, one uh, can do uh, you know or get tattoos on the skin and later on you want to remove that. Okay. So, these things are done essentially using lasers and uh, the kind of laser that is uh, used here are like dye laser, argon laser, diode laser, ruby laser etcetera. Nowadays, uh, you know the use of diode laser for these purposes are uh, very, very common. In this, you know area of gastroenterology, different type of uh, diseases like uh, gastrointestinal hemorrhage where you know the blood comes out uh, uh, due to peptic ulcer. Uh, Indiag is used, Indiag laser is used to treat that. Uh, lithotripsy to fragment common duct stones in human uh, is also uh, done by using lasers such as you know Q Swiss Indiag or dye lasers and uh, many uh, applications also uh, uh, you know the pulsed lasers are also used in many of the applications. So, uh, here uh, in this uh, page you can see an image where uh, this uh, skin treatment is uh, being done using a laser. Then uh, one of uh, the very important and nowadays very common surgery involving laser uh, which is known as uh, laser assisted in situ keratomyelitis or in short LASIK. Many of you must be uh, must have heard about this term LASIK at least. So, this LASIK surgery it involves a suction ring that holds the eye steady while uh, you know performing the uh, uh, this uh, micro keratom uh, which is essentially a cutting instrument uh, and this is you know put in proper place as you can see in this uh, image also. So, something is uh, holding this you know eye so that you know it is open and then you come with uh, this micro uh, keratome which is a kind of micro tome which is used to cut very thin slices and uh, afterwards you bring in your laser to do the oper uh, surgery. So, uh, this micro keratome which uh, you know cuts a very thin slice and then it is just you know uh, removed such that there is an end part still attached to the eye surface. So, that it acts like a hinge and once this is done then you bring your laser and you, uh, you uh, use the laser beam to you know uh, correct the curvature of the surface of uh, you know the retina. Uh, using laser ablation and uh, you correct your uh, power. Now, uh, few important points that I would like to discuss at this point that in surgery femtosecond pulses allow much more precise cutting than do nanosecond lasers okay, because they have you know uh, much high peak power compared to nanosecond lasers. Uh, and one of the biggest advantage of this ultra short pulses coming from femtosecond uh, lasers uh, in surgical applications is uh, 
that they limit the you know damage of the biological tissue. Okay. So, most of these medical applications so they involved uh, you know the laser contact with you know different parts of uh, you know uh, living body. So, uh, if the light is very you know strong then uh, if the body part absorbs a lot of light then that can be detrimental. Now, usage of this ultra short pulse uh, avoids this kind of uh, problems. Uh, because they are the, you know the skin is exposed for a very short period of time. So, the you know, amount of damage is very very limited. Okay. So, uh, the radiation and the you know biological tissue interaction is determined mainly by the laser irradiance uh, which depends on the pulse energy, pulse duration and the spectral range of the laser light. The interaction depends also on the thermal properties of the tissues such as heat conduction like uh, once the heat is generated at a place, uh, if the heat is you know quickly dissipated then the chances of damages are less and uh, you know also it depends on the heat capacity of the uh, particular uh, region or particular tissue that we are talking about and uh, how much light is reflected from that particular uh, surface or you know scattered or absorbed that also determines how much uh, interaction will take place between light and that particular you know say tissue and uh, whether there is a chance of damage or not. And uh, these biological tissues which uh, uh, are of our interest uh, when we uh, try to uh, do laser surgery, uh, they have several components and uh, the most uh, you know important you know components for us. Uh, be, uh, which actually contribute to the light absorption uh, includes melanin, hemoglobin and of course, uh, you know several uh, amino acids and proteins and water. Okay. So, they absorb lights of uh, various different uh, wavelengths. So, these are few things that we should uh, you know keep in mind and the spectra, the spectra of uh, several uh, absorption spectra of several such uh, components are you know shown here and you can see uh, that they have several absorption band in the different regions of uh, light spectrum starting from ultraviolet to infrared and the corresponding laser lines are also displayed here. So, if one wants to use the absorption property of these components within the biological tissue then one can selectively choose the wavelength by selectively choosing a particular laser and uh, uh, you know some uh, other properties are also uh, given here in this slide uh, where we uh, give the particular uh, wavelength of the laser that uh, you know uh, are normally used say for example, carbon dioxide laser, Indiac laser, argon ion laser and excima laser. And uh, one very important uh, parameter uh, which is known as penetration depth like if you shine laser on any particular uh, surface then how much below that surface laser light is present that is you know uh, determined by this penetration depth. Okay. So, if one needs to uh, you know use laser much successfully uh, you know and particularly uh, in a non-invasive way, then uh, much more penetration depth is required. Okay. So, here in this table certain some you know uh, values of the penetration depths for uh, those laser lights are given. Now, we talked about uh, interaction of biological tissues and laser light. Now, what are the different types of interactions that are possible? So, uh, basically we can uh, categorize this interaction into uh, the in this following you know five uh, uh, parts, uh, one is photochemical interaction, then thermal interaction, then plasma induced ablation, photo ablation and photo disruption. So, uh, in the you know adjacent plot it is shown like you know what are the uh, you know uh, what are the chances of having one of this type of interactions uh, as a function of the exposure time of laser. Now, using continuous wave laser or 
or exposure uh, time greater than 1 second, only photochemical interaction can be induced and uh, you know if you use a very you know few milliwatt of power, uh, you know you can use for this purposes. And for thermal interaction, uh, you need uh, to have a shorter uh, exposure time that is uh, uh, you know in the order of microsecond and uh, one must use very high power uh, and it can be this thermal effects can be induced both by continuous as well as pulse laser which has uh, you know moderately uh, moderate power that is uh, 15 to 20 watt 25 watt of power. Uh, next, uh, the photo ablation thing, it occurs at exposure time between 1 microsecond and 1 nanosecond. So, you can easily figure out that this happens at a very short time scale and uh, normally a nanosecond pulses of 10 power you know 6 to 10 power 9 watt per centimeter square irradiance are employed for these purposes. And uh, the plasma induced ablation and photo disruption, uh, this uh, uh, you know takes place for uh, pulses which are shorter than nanosecond. So, picosecond and femtosecond uh, lasers are uh, normally used and the uh, irradiance used is approximately uh, a terawatt per centimeter square. Now, both this plasma induced ablation and uh, photo disruption, they occur at uh, a kind of similar exposure time and a similar amount of irradiance and uh, but they differ according to the energy densities that are significantly lower for plasma induced ablation. Now, we will talk about each one of this type of interactions in little bit more detail. So, the photochemical interactions uh, they do not require a very high power density, we already mentioned that one and uh, approximately 1 watt per centimeter square power density and a longer uh, exposure time is just uh, required uh, and you can use a continuous wave laser successfully for this purpose. And for this category of interaction, uh, laser induces a chemical effects by initiating chemical reaction in tissue. Just as an example, uh, the vision processes in rhodopsin or protein pumping in bacterial rhodopsin, these are uh, proteins. Uh, are initiated by a laser beam for the visible range. Okay. Uh, and photochemical interactions are used uh, in photodynamic therapy. So, many of you probably have heard about this term photodynamic therapy or PDT in short that is used in uh, you know various uh, uh, medical treatment particularly related to uh, tumor or uh, cancer treatment. So, let us little bit, uh, let us have an idea about uh, this photodynamic therapy. So, essentially the photodynamic therapy utilizes the laser light effect on various chemical substances. For example, uh, porphyrin, porphyrin is uh, you know present in various uh, is in, you know uh, important uh, uh, components of uh, you know something like you know hemoglobin or myoglobin. Uh, these porphyrins are uh, you know present. So, uh, this uh, photodynamic therapy they utilizes the laser light effect on various chemical substances in an oxygen rich environment. We will see why. Light induces a sequence of reactions that uh, produce toxic substances such as singlet oxygen or some free radicals. Now, these substances are very reactive both single uh, singlet uh, oxygen species as well as free radical and can damage proteins, lipids, nucleic acid as well as other cell components. Okay. So, all it does is that you know laser light it generates singular oxygen or free radical and which in turn damages some protein, lipid or anything you know present nearby. Now, in photodynamic therapy a chemical substance known as a sensitizer is injected intravenous. During the next several hours, this sensitizer is distributed to the whole you know uh, organisms soft tissues okay. and that includes both uh, you know healthy tissue as well as affected tissues. Now, uh, you know, initially the substance uh, concentration is pretty much same in healthy tissues as well as affected tissues, but after uh, a long period of time like after 2 to 3 days, the sensitizer leaves the healthy tissues but uh, 
in cancerous cells they remain. So, they remain accumulated for 7 to 10 days. Now, uh, after 3 days when the healthy tissues have no more sensitizer, you uh, essentially can have uh, nearly 30 times higher concentration of the sensitizers in the affected cells. And at that time, that is after 3 days, uh, a patient is irradiated with laser light. And the laser light induces sequence of reactions with the excited singlet state of oxygen as the final product. And then singlet oxygen being very reactive, uh, it acts as a very toxic material and it reacts with components of biological cells and kills them. So, after 3 or 4 days when the laser is irradiated, it is made sure that they have left the healthy tissues because we do not want to kill the healthy tissues, we want to kill the affected tissues, the tissues which are cancerous. Okay? So, this time period is given so that all the healthy tissues are free from the sensitizer and only the affected tissues are targeted by laser which creates single oxygen and the singlet oxygen kills everything okay, within the cell. So, uh, the advantage of photodynamic therapy in cancer treatment over commonly used radio and chemotherapy uh, is that this is selective. In chemotherapy, the you know the organelles or the regions are exposed to this uh, you know and you know many cases the whole body is exposed to you know uh, radioactive chemicals and uh, this is totally unselective. So, it affects everything healthy and unhealthy. Now, here uh, we utilize a, you know a, uh, a selection of uh, healthy and unhealthy that is affected tissues by the sensitizer themselves. So, which decides that okay, uh, these are not healthy tissues. So, they just you know get out of that uh, you know. Uh, so, they, they, they find that okay, these are the healthy tissues. So, let us not be here and they just come out while the cancerous tissues they get more and more accumulated. So, after a certain time this is totally you know concentrated, the sensitizer are concentrated only into the affected areas. So, there when we shine laser, it kills only those cells which are affected. So, they are very, very you know selective. It also does not have those you know hazardous uh, consequences uh, of chemotherapy, okay, which many of you are aware that it causes several other uh, side effects, okay, which are uh, really, really hazardous. And uh, so, what is the sensitizer that is used mostly? Uh, uh, hematoporphyrin derivatives as well as uh, dihematoporphyrin ethers are used as sensitizer for these purposes. So, in this picture the mechanism of the photodynamic therapy is given. So, light falls on the sensitizer, sensitizer it uh, helps the oxygens to be converted into a single oxygen and then <coughs> this singlet oxygen it goes and kills the uh, surrounding you know uh, protein, lipid, vesicle whatever is there in that cell. So, uh, this sensitizer they have their own photochemistry uh, and uh, you know one needs to know uh, quite a bit of detail about the photochemistry of this sensitizer in order to understand uh, or in order to be able to uh, make a much better uh, way to treat cancers using laser. Okay. We are not going into the detail of this uh, photochemistry of the sensitizers. Uh, Next, we will move into another type of interaction which is thermal interaction. So, these thermal interactions are induced in a tissue by the increase in local temperature which uh, immediately is clear from the name itself and this increase in temperature is caused by the laser beam that we are shining with. Uh, in contrast to the photochemical uh, interaction method, uh, the thermal interaction can occur without you know. Uh, any specific reaction path and is highly non-selective and also non-specific, which is a bit disadvantage. Okay. Uh, now, depending on the temperature achieved, the thermal effect on the tissue can be classified as uh, reversible hypothermia, which is for temperature greater than 31 degree centigrade, which uh, in, in, that, in, uh, in that case uh, some function of the tissue can be perturbed 
but the uh, effect is reversible. So, we withdraw the laser, you know, the things, uh, the tissue condition will revert back. Uh, next, you can have uh, at a comparatively higher temperature that is greater than 42 degree centigrade, you have irreversible hypothermia. So, here contrary to the previous one is the conditions of the tissue after the laser exposure will not be reversible. Uh, with the larger uh, temperatures like you know greater than 60 degree or greater than 100 degrees or 150 degrees or even 300 degrees, there are several other uh, processes like coagulation or vaporization, carbonization or even pyrolysis you know is possible. Now, uh, in certain cases uh, all of this thermal uh, effects can be observed as a result of interaction with laser light. Uh, and most uh, applications, uh, one effect will dominate, uh, others will be uh, kind of subdued, but you may see most of them. Now, uh, one effect can dominate uh, depending on the goal of the you know, surgery. For example, an indiac laser beam traveling uh, a long path in the tissue is used to uh, achieve coagulation, whereas a carbon dioxide laser are more suitable for vaporization. So, this is also uh, used for the treatment of uh, you know tumors where you want to uh, you know get rid of that whole affected tissue, but uh, you know the problem remains that uh, this is highly uh, non-specific okay, and non-selective uh, contrary to the uh, photochemical interaction which apparently seems much better than thermal. But nevertheless, uh, the thermal uh, interaction is another method of uh, you know uh, treating cancerous uh, patients using laser. Uh, next, we will talk about photoablation. So, uh, uh, what happens in case of photoablation? So, a molecule is promoted to uh, a repulsive excited state, which is like a dissociative state, which we have seen uh, during this class many a times and uh, then it uh, you know undergo dissociation. Now, this chemical bond is broken due to dissociation, uh, which also causes the disruption of the biological tissue, because I am exciting the molecules within this biological uh, system and dissociating it. So, dissociating a molecule within the biological system means the biological dis total disruption of the biological system itself. Now, as electronic transitions occur uh, in the ultraviolet range, the photoablation process is usually limited to UV lasers. <coughs> Therefore, uh, excimer lasers uh, uh, is used uh, quite a lot. Uh, within excimer laser, you can think of you know argon uh, fluoride or Kipton fluoride or you know xenon chloride or xenon fluoride type of lasers. And uh, <coughs> uh, not only the fundamental of those so which fall in the UV region, but also you can generate the higher harmonic of those lasers to get into the deep UV to uh, uh, you know be able to do the photoablation. And uh, here on the uh, you know screen we are showing the uh, pictorial depiction of this photoablation process, uh, where a dissociative state is shown on your left, uh, where the excitation is taking place and then from there it is dissociating completely. Whereas, uh, you can have uh, an excitation uh, above the dissociation level for a bound excited state as well and achieve the dissociation. Okay. So, uh, this is summarized here also like absorption in the UV range followed by transport of the excited state, uh, you know in which the repulsive interaction dominates. Then it undergo dissociation and then uh, you know you achieve the condition of ablation. Uh, the next part will be the plasma induced ablation, where a typical lasers used for plasma induced ablation are NDAG or NDYLF type of laser and uh, the irradiance that is used approximately a terawatt per centimeter square. And uh, you, can, you can imagine these are all basically Q Swiss laser, because that can give you that much of uh, you know energy or irradiance. Uh, also an ultra short pulse from a Q Swiss or Modlock laser. Uh, it ionizes the biological tissue and generates very large density of free electrons in a very short period of time with typical values of 10 to the power 18 cc uh, per cc. Uh, 
due to an avalanche effect. So, one you know free radical creates another free radical. So, if you generate 10 free radicals, those 10 free radicals themselves will ge generate another say 100 free radicals and then you know it will keep going. So, it is like a chain reaction or an avalanche effect. So, this uh, free electrons uh, from this ionization process, they accelerate to high energies and they go and collide with the molecules which leads further ionization as I said. This light, there may be light electron, there may be heavier electrons, uh, heavier ions produced in this process and they move at different velocities which lead to uh, the effect similar to that in the acoustic wave where areas of you know compression and dilation uh, take place. Here uh, we have we are showing that in uh, uh, you know in a schematic way. So you have a you know laser generating this uh, ions and electrons, and uh, they do their job in the next step. These are the few applications of uh, lasers in biology. Uh, we wish we could cover many more such applications, but uh, due to the shortage of time, we have to stop here. So, uh, in the next day, uh, we will come with uh, some more applications of lasers in uh, the field of material science and engineering and also in optical communication. Thank you very much for your attention.